Okay, very good. My name is Tom Fontana. I'm with the Ohio Soybean Council. Our location is just outside Columbus, Ohio. We represent the soybean farmers in the state of Ohio. And the idea today is to let you know uh, a little bit about how farmers harvest their crops and uh, where, where their crops go and what they're used for and that sort of thing. Uh, we will have some time at the end of uh, the presentation for questions, but as our director Dan said, uh, feel free to let us know if you have questions anytime. We appreciate it. Uh, our farmers are very interested in education, uh, particularly letting students K through 12 uh, understand the connection between science and agriculture and what the connection is. So hopefully you'll get a feel for that today as well. With that, I would like to introduce our farmer who's participating in the tour today, uh, Scott Mexter, Metzger. Scott is from South Central Ohio. And at this point, I'll let Scott introduce himself, tell a little bit about his family and his farm. Um, hi, everyone. I'm glad uh, everyone could join today uh, in this. Uh, as Tom said, I'm from uh, South Central Ohio. I'm a uh, sixth generation grain farmer. Uh, I farm with my uh, uncle and two cousins. And uh, today we're selling corn. Um, we we uh, raise soybeans, but uh, it's pretty important now to get the get the corn crop off. Um, so I'm I'm actually selling corn today. I'm also the uh, I'm on, I sat on our soybean association and our our uh, Ohio Soybean Council as well as our national board. So um, pretty involved in stuff. Enjoy it. Uh, as you can see, I've got uh, three kids there, two boys and a girl. And uh, my wife actually, she's a school teacher uh, as well. So ed education runs uh, runs pretty deep in our family. I we've got several teachers and had family members on school boards and everything else. So uh, education and connecting with everyone is, uh, is pretty important in our operation. Very good, thanks Scott. As you can see, Scott's farm and uh, uh, as he said, a sixth generation farmer. So uh, his family's been in, the, in this business a long time. Uh, Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, just kind of go over uh, what crops you do grow. You mentioned soybean and corn, uh, but, and then proceed into uh, maybe the growth stages of a soybean, uh, the general growth stages and how you know it's time to harvest. Oh, okay. Yeah, like, like I said, we, we raise uh, soybean, corn, wheat, and barley. As uh, well, we we farm about 3,200 uh, acres or so, roughly 17 to 1,800 acres of uh, of uh, soybeans and 1,000 1,200 acres of corn is what we have this year, and we'll have uh, close to uh, 400 acres of wheat and 110 acres of barley. So that's um, that's that's what we do in our operation. Um, as far as as far as the soybeans, uh, Dan, if you want to start putting putting those uh, slides up. So in the springtime, we here in Ohio, uh, we'll start um, we'll start in March or April. We actually go out and uh, we'll spray the field, and we we know till all of our beans. So we'll we spray the field, um, and uh, we we'll call it burn down. Uh, so we've got a got a clean. Uh, weed-free uh, bed uh, to plant into, and when the soil temperatures are right, uh, we'll go ahead and go ahead and get started no-till and beans. It's usually anywhere from the 20th of April clear up to, you know, the middle of May. Um, it's kind of the time frame on it. So uh, the pictures you see there on the left, that's a, that's a soybean that's probably been in the ground two to, two to three days, uh, four maybe, depending on the temperature. Uh, when it sprouts, um, and then there on the on the right hand side, when the beans are up out of the ground, that's that's usually two to two to three weeks later, depending on the soil conditions and 
the temperature and the weather we're having, but that's, you know, the, uh, the earlier you're planned, if, if your soils are a little bit, bit colder, it's a little bit slower coming up, but, you know, if you're in that, if you're in that May time frame, uh, when the soils are warmer and, and the days are warmer and get a little bit longer day length, you know, they'll, they'll pop up, you know, in a, in a week sometimes, so, and there, there we have it, that, that would be, uh, that, when the first comes out of the ground, that's the, 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 the first trifoliate that comes out, um, that comes up out of the ground. And here we have uh, <clears throat> just, I guess, I guess well, that's, we're just checking the, well, just checking the beans there. That's, that's probably about, uh, that's probably about a month after they're planted roughly in that time frame. Okay. Uh, here, uh, when the um, this is the flowering stage of, of soybeans, so where those flowers are at, actually, actually where the where the pods will develop at, and that that time frame usually starts um, in the in the middle of June, most generally. Um, it a lot of that's dictated by sunlight and and day length. As the day gets longer, they'll they'll start flowering, and that at that same time that. That's uh, when we will post supply our chemicals um, as well. When the when the soybeans are flowering, um, that's that's a, right around that time they'll be they'll normally be um, uh, somewhere two three foot tall somewhere in that time frame or in that time range or in that range. Um, the next the next slide with that they have up here is uh, obviously the soybean um, when they're when they're making their pods. And that that'll most generally occur in that um, July time frame, early early July. And then if uh, usually that that's when we that's when we, if we need to we'll spray a um, fungicide on it to help help control any diseases that may in the bean that may be in the beans that will will limit our yield on it. And they'll, they'll at that time they're probably waist high, um, at least waist high on me. <laughs> And here's the here's the last pick. That that look that's what they look like when they're ready to harvest. And soybean harvest here uh, in this area usually occurs from the middle of September. Is usually when we start. Um, some of your earlier maturities will will be developed then on up into October. Uh, usually by the first week of October, everything is pretty well turned and and ready to harvest. But um, in our operation, we usually start. Uh, we we usually start selling corn first uh, to just get get things going and um, get get the corn off at the right right moisture that we like it to be at and then once we get to the about the third week of September uh, we most normally then will start um, change over and start cutting beans uh, we get the when we uh, we pick the fields that we're going to sow wheat into and those are the bean fields to get cut first. So kinda of, kind of all over the place there for a while till we get those till we get those fields or farms done that's going to get sown to wheat. Uh, yeah. Uh, Scott, can you tell us how you know that the soybeans are at the right time to harvest? Yeah, so in that uh, the last slide he showed there whenever that, that brown collar and the and the leaves are off of them. Um, that that's a good indication that they're time to uh, that it's time to start harvesting. It'll be um, uh, you know you want the want the beans to be between well to, to dry is is um, thirteen and a half percent or under down here at the elevator. So any, anywhere between that anywhere from seven sixteen and a half sixteen percent under uh, we'll start we'll start cutting beans then. Um, if they're in that 16% range, we'll go ahead and put them in a the grain bin and, uh, and dry them down and then haul them in later. We, we store most of, uh, we store most of our crop here on the farm. We're fortunate enough to have, uh, two bins set up that, that allow us to haul or to hold, um, the majority of the, of the ground we farm. Um, and then yeah, we. Those, just, just to be clear, those percentages are the amount of moisture in the soybeans, right? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, correct. So, yeah, so it would be, they would be, uh, yeah, thir 13 to 16% moisture in the soybeans. Okay. Yeah, 
If you wouldn't mind turning the camera around and showing the classrooms what you're up to right now. Uh, well, sorry. So right now, because I don't have my green car driver here, I'm not sure where he's at. I'm uh, just unloading on the semi here. Uh, we've got three semis to run and two grain carts. Uh, and this, so as I normally the grain cart would be doing this, but I don't have a grain cart driver here yet. But that, uh, so I'm just unloading on one of our semis here, and uh, it'll it'll go from here over to our bin site that's a couple miles away, and mm -hmm. we'll uh, it'll it'll be ran through a it's called a dryer, actually dries the corn down. We put uh, dry it with uh, heat that uh, the, the from propane and uh then it'll it'll go in the uh then it'll go in our bin and we'll haul it out uh ah, we'll start hauling some out in december but we haul grain from pretty much december until uh december until late summer normally okay well uh you can see scott's field there uh and he's uh, getting ready to go out and start harvesting more corn. Um, so uh, we thought it might be interesting for you to see a little video, a quick video about how a combine actually works. It's an uh, uh, interesting process, uh, so we might want to start that. Dan, do you want to fire up the uh, video at this point? Or do you want to show Scott going through the field here real quick? <laughs> we can take a look at Scott going through the field here real quick. I do have the video about how it works. We can look at, just kind of take a look at how Scott gets things going here with corn. It's, it's going to be a little bit different looking with corn than what it does soybean. Yeah, so uh, here I am just starting in. Um, that's, the, that's the corn head down there, and it, uh, it obviously gets, you, know, you can see what it's doing there, but it's it, it's basically separating the the ear from the from the stalk, and then it runs in through the machine where that where that on the feeder house down there, and goes up in the machine, and it's got a uh, you know, this machine is a rotor machine, so it basically turns on the turns on the, the inside and uh, separates the separates the corn from the um, uh, from the uh, Top on it, and, uh, and then goes up into our to the, the grain tank here behind me. You can kind of see it coming in, so that's that's what it looks like as it's coming into the tank there on it. So some of the uh, some of the controls on the uh, on the tractor here. That that the control there. That that's what pretty much runs the combine. Uh, there's several different screens stuff on it and then we're uh, we use an iPad to record all of our all of our data out of the field we we use that when we're when we're from planting to spraying to combining uh, that's that's basically how we're keeping our records on there so that's a that's very a little good. bit about the combine very good thanks so, so we do have a video, Tom, that we can show kind of how it works. A combine works on the inside there. There are three processes that actually go into um, harvesting, and that's why it's called a combine, because it combines those processes. Uh, so we'll show that video real quick for you. Very good. All combines must perform three vital tasks to effectively harvest a grain crop. Feeding, processing, and cleaning. The feeding system works by gathering the crop from the field and delivering it into the combine. The head gathers the crop by stripping, cutting, or picking it up off the ground. Different heads must be used for different types of crops. Once gathered, the feeder house receives the crop from the head and moves it to the processor for threshing and separating. All combines have a processor, generally a cylinder or rotor, designed to gently remove or thresh the grain from the plant. The rotor rotates in one direction, processing the crop material. As the material moves through the rotor, it rubs across a metal grate or concave. The rubbing action removes the grain from the plant material. 
The grain, and some small material other than grain, known as mog, falls through the concave, where it's permanently separated from larger plant material. The larger straw and mog moves toward the rear of the machine for discharge. After the crop is threshed and separated, gravity causes the heavier materials, like grain, to continue to fall through the cleaning shoe. The chaffer and sieve move back and forth to separate the grain from the mog. This action ensures that the material is always moving. Once the grain is clean, it moves to the grain handling system for storage and transfer. The grain remains in the grain tank until it's offloaded using the unloading auger, which swings out from the combine over a grain truck. Well, very good. That gives you an idea of the processes that are involved with uh, uh, combining. Uh, Scott, you mentioned some of this, but uh, uh, you mentioned that you offload the grain and you store some of it uh, on your farm. Uh, but after it leaves your farm, where where does it go? How does that work? So yeah, so I, so when we start to haul out the bins, uh, we uh, our our soybeans they go uh, they'll go to uh, to a local elevator uh, Cargill um, is, is the one we primarily primarily haul to um, as, as you can see there that uh, those are those are all grain bins so that's once once they leave our grain bins then they go to the elevator and and so then from that point uh, as far as the soybeans they'll uh, uh, at least the facility we haul to, most of them go to North Carolina and South Carolina to a soybean crushing plant, and uh, they'll get crushed for soybean meal, which is uh, used to feed livestock. You can see here from the uh, pictures the unloading of the grain at a facility, um, and uh, so on. Uh, after uh, Scott mentioned that uh, his beans uh, primarily go to North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, but there are two different markets, a domestic and an export market for soybeans. You can see on the infographic here, uh, as Scott mentioned, uh, you know, you ship and store the soybeans uh, it domestically, then they're most likely to get processed into soybean meal and soybean oil are the two primary uh, constituents of the soybean. And uh, the soy protein is used for animal feed primarily, and the soybean oil is used in food as vegetable oil and other ingredients in food. And it's also a fair amount is used to make biodiesel, which is a renewable diesel fuel, and it ends up with the consumer. In the export market, uh, it's a little more complicated. Uh, so you go through the in-country shipping and storage. Some of the soybeans may actually be processed in the U.S., but a large percentage of them are shipped as whole soybeans, off to the international market. So they may uh, go to New Orleans or the West Coast or the East Coast and then be shipped to uh, customers in other countries. So uh, we can look at some pictures of some of the modes of transportation. Uh, soybeans travel, many soybeans travel by train. Uh, railroads are very important to the transportation and logistics associated with moving farm products. Um, as you see here, uh, this is at a, a soybean facility and loading up the train cars uh, to head somewhere else. This is uh, uh, another example of a car being uh, filled.
Soybeans do travel by truck. Uh, most of the truck traffic is probably shorter distances. Uh, so we already saw the railroad connection uh, with soybeans, but an important part of transportation are our rivers. Uh, this is a barge. Uh, prod could be very well be on the Mississippi River. Uh, the Ohio River, the Mississippi, the Missouri River are all and many other rivers are all important for transporting soybeans and getting them to, to a port. You see here a, can, a, a ship at a port. Uh, uh, these ocean going ships are very important for moving uh, agricultural products around the world. And uh, this particular one is a container ship, but some ships are, uh, carry soybeans not in containers but in bulk in the hold of the ship and uh, to go to Asia or Europe or, or perhaps South America. So the international market for soybeans is extremely important. Uh, last year, approximately 60% of our U.S. soybeans were exported. Uh, a large portion of that was exported to the country of China. Uh, we also export to uh, Mexico, some to Canada, to Europe, uh, other Asian countries, and the Middle East and other places around the world. Uh, because some of you are probably aware of the export situation has changed quite a bit, especially with China. Uh, those were some Chinese customers in the previous slide. These are Japanese customers. But with China, uh, due to tariffs that have been imposed uh, by the U.S. on Chinese goods, the Chinese decided to uh, put uh, tariffs on soybeans. So that has dramatically changed how the export market looks for U.S. soybean farmers. Some other parts of the world uh, are importing more soybeans uh, from our farmers uh, than they were previously, which is a good thing. Uh, but I think I can honestly say that uh, that has not up, made up for the decrease in sales to China at this point. South America is shipping large, large quantities of soybeans to China uh, to make up for um, the lack of soybeans coming from the U.S. Uh, Scott, I don't know if you want to jump in on the international marketing and and tariff issue, but feel free if. Uh, um, yeah, like uh, like Tom like Tom was saying there, um, China has been our uh, I guess bread and butter if you want to say that here over the past several years, and we've the uh, uh, the, the soybean council. He has worked, uh, you know, for 30 to 40 years on on capturing those markets over there, and it, uh, it it's an it's an important part to us. And uh, just on our just in our operation alone, um, the price of beans uh, back when they announced the tariffs were in that ten ten dollar ten dollar to eleven dollar range uh, per bushel, and uh, right now we're looking at uh, it's in that. Eight eight and a half dollar range, eight eight eighty somewhere in through there. So we're we're almost two dollars a a bushel less, um, just because of not the only reason, but that has a big part of it uh, uh, with the tariffs and everything that's going on with the trade. Uh, in our in our operation alone, just that that two dollar a bushel difference. That's uh, that's several hundred thousand dollars that we're uh, could potentially lose out on this. Um, no, not so much this year because we've got a good portion of our crop contracted already. But but looking forward into next year, that uh, that's a that's a big hit on our income, uh, any way you look at it. But yep. the trade, uh, regardless of who it's with, is important. But we, uh, uh, you know, that's when when we're sending everything so much that we're sending to China like we are when they do what they do or have done. It's that's uh, that's having have an adverse impact on on us at the farm level as well as everyone that we deal with and and the community
communities in general. I mean, it's it's not just uh, it's not just at the farm. It's it's the places where we deal, like our uh, equipment dealership, um, our uh, the fertilizer plants, um, any of the ag retailers, um, seed dealers, and and everywhere. It's it's a it's a ripple effect as it goes out. Yeah. Well, I think it may be time for a few questions. We have some more th things to show you a little later. Uh, are the, do any of the classrooms have any particular questions? I, I know that I have a list of questions from John C. Dunham STEM School. I could start uh, in general. It seems like there's a lot of interest in that classroom about GMOs. So, uh, Scott, could you uh, tell us, are you growing GMO crops? And if you are, uh, why it's important that you do that? Uh, yeah, so in our, our operation, uh, where we, uh, we grow GM, GMO soybeans and GMO uh, corn, both. Um, for, for us, it's just a, it's just a matter of, of uh, the simple economics of it. Um, by having GMO soybeans, that allows us to spray less chemicals on it uh, throughout the growing year, and it's um, it, 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 it the economics of it uh, works out well for us. We're able to have good weed control, and it's it's a safe uh, it's a safe product. Um, you know, I I uh, I guess if I didn't feel it was safe, I wouldn't be wouldn't be doing it. All right. Very good. Questions from our classrooms. Do I see any hands waving or? Yeah. Uh, which school? Willard. Okay, Willard. Saint Saint Mary has a has a question. Oh, Saint Mary's. Okay, go ahead. Uh, we were wondering how corn specifically would be harvested that would stay on the cob for human consumption that way versus to be made into like livestock feed? What are the differences in harvesting? Uh, so, so with that, um, the, 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 the operation would be a little bit different. It's uh, like with, uh, like with sweet corn, um, that, that would be, uh, that, that would, there's a sweet corn picker. So it's how it works. Um, it's got the it's the same kind of principle as what the the corn head is is here, but it it just doesn't go through the rotor and stuff, and and then allows it to stay on the ear. Um, but that that's about the that's about the only way that it does it when it stays on the cob. But there are some livestock farmers that have that will still pick corn, and uh, and by doing that, it's the same principle. It just it it stays on the stays on the cob that way, and then they'll they grind it up in their grinder to feed corn with it or to feed their cows with it. I think it's fair to say that if uh, most of the corn you see when you're driving up and down the highway is being harvested the way Scott is doing it and sweet corn or corn on the cob for human consumption, uh, usually are, they're smaller fields and uh, uh, the operation is different. So, but a good question, very good question. Other questions, did Willard have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, um, when you showed your iPad earlier in the combine, what did uh -huh. it, in the, on the iPad, what were the different colors meaning? So on the, yeah, so on the iPad, that's, that's just, uh, that's just the, the yield variability across the field on it. Um, hang on, I'll pull it up here. And uh, you can see it a little bit better that way. So as the so as the as the collars there on it. So the red the red is not good and the green is good. This is actually this is actually one of our this will be our worst cornfield we're in this year. It had way too much rain and has a lot of tile issues with it. So. Where you know where you see the red at, which should normally be green, um, but that's that's what the collar different, differentiation is. And then um, we'll also use that when we spread fertilizer. We'll upload this data um, in in our in our software. We'll we'll spread the fertilizer based off of the yield that we've taken off the field. 
Other questions? Good question. Yeah, very good question. Okay, go ahead. Are GMOs harmful to us or the plants? Could you, could you repeat that again? I'm sorry. He asked if uh, GMOs are harmful to humans or to the plants. Um, no, we, uh, now as far as to the plants, the, the plants themselves are, are bred uh, to be resistant to the, to what, um, to the chemicals that uh, we spray on them. And, and with us, we, uh, it's, it's uh, Roundup is what we use. So it's, it's, um, it's, the, the plant itself is, is bred to not get hurt um, by spraying Roundup on it. And uh, at, as far as, um, as far as the amounts we, uh, as far as the amounts of like Roundup we spray, it, uh, we usually run uh, 32 ounces to the acre. So that would be like taking a, uh, it'd be like taking um, a couple pop, cans of pop, or I, a couple cans of pop and, and spreading that amount over uh, an acre is about the size of a football field. And when we're spraying, we actually, um, we usually spray 15 gallon of water per acre. So when you see a sprayer running through the field, uh, like for ours, for instance, it's got a thousand gallon tank on it. Uh, the majority of the load uh, that, that's in there is water. So it's, it's water and Roundup what we're, what we're spraying um, on it. And as far as uh, as far as being safe, I guess I'll put it this way: we have we have GMO sweet corn, and um, everybody in my family eats it. So if it uh, if I didn't feel it was safe, I wouldn't wouldn't let um, wouldn't let my family eat it. And and uh, going back going to the science side of it, you know, sound science says that it's safe. So yeah, I think if you do uh, research on GMOs, the a very, very high percentage of all the research that has been done, and you can look at this yourself, uh, has proven that GMOs are safe. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there are people out there who don't think that is the case, and they probably, to be honest with you, get uh, uh, more traction uh, on the internet and in the press and so forth than the folks who have studied it carefully and determined that it does not cause problems uh, for human for human health. So uh, it's an interesting question. So uh, uh, GMOs are a, certainly an important uh, topic, but you know, we have millions, uh, we have billions of people in this world and it's gonna take all kinds of technology and agricultural systems to feed, uh, you know, nine to 10 billion people by the year 2050. So uh, you just can't feed people uh, with one, using one method or one system or technology. Well, and I, and I guess, Tom, if I could interject there a little bit, too, uh, you know, with the, with our, well, and I'll just, here's how we usually harvest. We usually usually unload on the go like this uh, in the grain cart, and then the grain cart takes it to the semi. Um, this is the most efficient way to harvest. Uh, that way the combine is always going. Um, I always say the grain cart's the most critical port critical part of the operation because it, it keeps the combine going and keeps the semis going, the dryer going. So that's a, just a real quick view of how, how we normally, uh, how we normally will uh, unload on the go. Sorry about that. Give me things at once. Uh, but back to what I was saying, Tom, on the, uh, with uh, spraying on the GMO crop versus non-GMO, you know, actually our, our GMO beans, we actually spray less on them. Uh, than what we do on our GMO crops, and, and what's sprayed on the GMO crops is, is safe as well. But like I said, that just comes back to an economic standpoint of it being more economical to, to spray one chemical on it versus having uh, three or four different chemical combinations to control the to control the weeds that um, that one chemical will do. Okay, very good. Uh, another question. Okay. I get we. 
we had a couple questions about just being a farmer in general. Um, first of all, about the combine, the machine itself, is that something that you would purchase or something that you would rent? I know that they're very expensive. We're wanting uh, to know maybe a dollar amount on that. And then also the fuel consumption on a machine of that size um, we are interested in also. Um, oh, and then yesterday I learned that there are not very many plants that have been genetically modified. Um, maybe only 10 is what I heard. And uh, if that's true, what are the 10? Okay, those are, those are all excellent questions. Uh, well, I'll start with the first one you asked there on the, um, on the combine. We, you can do both. Um, you can own, own one or lease one. Uh, this, this machine, we, we own this one. Uh, we do have a couple of tractors that we lease. Um, as far as the as far as the dollar amount, um, this machine uh, new would be probably in that three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollar range. Uh, the the wow. corn heads here on the front, um, it would be in that ninety to a hundred thousand dollar range. And I don't know if we showed any videos of a uh, of the uh, of what we use. To cut beans, but it's a it's a completely different head. Uh, we run a draper header, and those are in that seventy to eighty thousand dollar range, depending on what size you get. So you're you're pretty easily in that uh, five to six hundred thousand dollar range on a on a new machine. Um, I guess owning versus leasing uh, a couple couple different things there with that. If you if you lease it, uh, yeah, there's a so there's a picture picture of a of a soybean, uh, which is a head to cut soybeans with, but it's probably yeah, different. Um, yeah. uh, as far as, uh, as far as the lease and the known and part of it, just kind of that comes down to the economics of it. There's some advantages to leases versus uh, advantage to owning and, and then vice versa on that. And then, um, as far as the fuel consumption, I can pull that up on my screen here. If I can, if I can, uh, find it. I've got it up here somewhere. Hang on here a second. I can give you anything there for more. Uh, hang on here a second. It's what it's when you're when you're shelling corn, you obviously use uh, a lot more a lot more fuel than when you're when you're uh, cutting beans. You've got more more material going through the machine and uh, more going on. I it's it's uh, somewhere it'd be probably seventeen eighteen um, gallons an hour of fuel we use when we're shelling corn and uh probably probably 15 or so cutting beans i think the fuel tank on here holds a couple hundred gallons it'll if we have a pretty long day selling corn um you know we'll, we'll go through a tank of fuel a day on this i was trying to pull i can find it on here you just have to give me a second what exactly is but uh as far as your what was your other question i'm sorry about how many plants were gmo <laughs> It's about the GMO crop, Scott. I'll, I'll go through them again. Yeah, you, yeah. if you could hit on that, Tom, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Uh, GMO seeds in the United States. Corn, soybeans, cotton, alfalfa, sugar beets, canola, squash, zucchini, squash and zucchini, papaya, <laughs> potato, and apple. Those are the ten. But a good question. Do we yeah, have and I, oh, and I just want to say I found it on my screen. It's I'm using right now. I'm using about 15 gallons an hour selling corn. And if if you get into better corn, uh, the better the corn is. Obviously, the more the more you'll use. So I I'd say anywhere from 12 to 15 gallons an hour, depending on how good the crop is. Very good. Uh, if we could just run through some of the uses for soybeans really quickly, uh, Dan, uh, so people get an idea of uh, the uses. We've already talked about 
uh, animal feed. Uh, that's both in this country and abroad export markets with pigs and chickens being the two biggest. I mentioned biodiesel fuel as a diesel fuel a replacement for replacing petroleum diesel. Soybean, soybean oil is used in paints uh, and all kinds of uh, plastics and so forth. Here you see hand sanitizer, um, cleaners. Uh, it, they're used, soybean oil is used in cosmetics as well. Um, and uh, it's used in foam, particularly Ford Motor Company uses soybean-based foam in their car seats and some of their other part, plastic parts. And uh, vegetable oil is uh, primarily uh, soybean oil, uh, vegetable oil that you get in the uh, supermarket. Uh, and soybean is or soybean products are in a wide variety of food products, anything from chocolate candy uh, to salad dressings to baking pro baked goods, um, very, a lot of uh, food applications. An interesting use for a soybean-based product is the backing for AstroTurf. So, for example, at The Ohio State University, the baseball field is uh, AstroTurf and the backing on that is soy based. So there are a wide variety of uses, uses for soybean products. So with that, uh, let's go see uh, if there are any, another round of questions. Do any of the schools have any more questions for any of us on the question. call? Anybody have a question? Anybody have a question? Any other questions? If, if not, we appreciate your participation on behalf of Ohio Soybean Farmers and our education platform called GrowNextGen.org. We thank you for participating today. So we want to go around and personally thank each of you, each of the schools that participated, and say goodbye and thank you. So Director Dan, can you take us through... Uh, through the school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you.